We next have a closing uh, guest keynote, which will be followed by the awards and the symposium closing. For presenting our guest uh, keynote speaker, I would like to invite uh, Professor Gal Chechik. Uh, please, Gal. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, Elad. Hi. Uh, so we are honored to have Elad Hazan with us. Um, Elad actually did his, uh, I think, undergrad, both uh, BSc and MSc here in Tel Aviv University, then his PhD at Princeton. And we are very lucky to have him here. Elad has done... Uh, similar work. I think he's mostly known for his work in online learning where he had groundbreaking contributions to the theory and algorithm and problem setup of online learning. And um, he uh, won numerous awards. Uh, he was the chair of the most important conference in uh, uh, machine learning theory, called. And today he's gonna tell us about control. Thank you, Gal. Uh, thank you, everyone, for bearing um, until the end of today. And I'll, I know this, I'm the only one standing between you and going home. I'll try to make it short. Uh, thank you for the invitation to the organizer. It's a really lovely conference. Uh, my name is Elad Khazan. I'm a professor at Princeton, and I uh, manage a Google Lab there also. And I'll talk about a subject which I should have studied better when I was an undergrad right here in the Sackler uh, Faculty for Engineering, but I didn't. But now I'm trying to make up. So this is called the control theory, um, and I'll try to give a machine learning perspective. Uh, by the way, feel free to ask me any questions during the talk. I don't mind kind of getting through all the slides. I prefer that uh, things are clear. I'll talk about work with uh, several of my students and colleagues at Google uh, and elsewhere, including Shamka Kade, who is a professor at the University of Washington, and the rest of the people here are uh, students of mine. The code for the topic that I will discuss is available freely off GitHub, and I encourage you to, um, to go to these links and try it out um, and contribute if you want. This code, by the way, was written by uh, these uh, three students, John, Paolo, and Alex, who are all undergraduate at Princeton. Um, yeah, so this is the subject I didn't quite pay attention to when I was uh, an undergraduate here in engineering in Sackler. Uh, but I found out to be extremely important, extremely elegant, and very mathematically deep. Um, and the problem is that of control. And what do we mean by control? It's a subcase of reinforcement learning where we're trying, we have much more structure, usually physical structure about the world, and we're trying to influence a system to achieve some kind of desired output. So this is a, an example of a dynamical system. It's called an inverted pendulum. Um, so we have some kind of a cart and on top of it some pole and at the top of the pole we have some ball or something and of course gravity works against us if you will the pole wants to fall down um, and we have control over the bottom cart we can pull it apply force to it left or right assume there are only two degrees of freedom here and the goal is to uh, balance this um, top ball here to stay upright so this is the kind of example that we are uh, considering now, this subject has a lot, a lot, a lot of applications. Maybe the most important one today, um, so uh, Professor Shashua talked, I think, this morning about uh, autonomous driving, which is probably the most important um, application of machine learning at all, anywhere. Um, and there is a lot of control going into that, about controlling the car or uh, applying some um, um, input to the controls of the car uh, in terms of directing it where to drive. Uh, drones is an extremely popular application, um, and this is, this is very classic theory that has applied to manufacturing and uh, telecommunications anywhere. So you can imagine this example of the uh, cart pole, inverted pen pendulum, applied to all sorts of manufacturing problems, and especially robotics. We want to control, for example, uh, the arm of a robot or joint of a robot and so on. Um, here is the mathematical description of the problem. We have some input U. And this is an input that we, cont we control. So we, we select these U's, and these U's go into the system, and out comes an X. So in the pendulum example, you can think of U as being left or right, or how much force to apply left or right. And then X, X is called the state of the system also. That is the position 
So it could be the position. Uh, these are re vector, random, vector variables, so they could be the position of the ball, the cart, and angles, and so on. Um, and the way that the input connects to the output is a complicated procedure. It's a dynamic uh, structure. So there is some function f that takes as an input your, your control, the current state of the system, um, and some perturbation, because there is always noise in the, system, in the world. And that determines the next state, the next position of the pendulum, robot, drone, whatever it is. Um, and this system um, has some kind of evolves according to the to the function here, which could be arbitrarily complicated. So this is the setup that I want to discuss. Um, now this has been studied forever. Okay, so the picture here is, uh, this is Rudolf Kalman, he's a pioneer, you probably all heard about the Kalman filter, um, and he is receiving here the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President Obama for his work on the Kalman filter and other work in control, which uh, allowed uh, the United States to develop all sorts of, uh, uh, to get man to the moon, basically. Um, and this is a, re so we sent a paper to a conference and got this review, saying, as opposed to deep learning, control got us to the moon. Uh, I love this uh, quote, even though I'm more on the, on the deep learning side, the control side, but I thought this is very nice and, and also true. Um, but things have changed since Kalman worked on the problem since the 60s, um, and a lot of things have changed in, in uh, machine learning and deep, deep learning revolution in particular. So we now have, con we would like to use controllers that are based on deep neural nets, right? This technology has, is everywhere. It is used in practice. Uh, but of course, it's hard to say things even about supervised learning, nonetheless about control or dynamical uh, system control using deep learning. Um, we have misspecified systems, adversarial noise. For example, when you fly a drone, it is maybe unrealistic to expect the perturbation in the, in the wind to be Gaussian, right? Maybe there's wind blowing according to all sorts of variations that are not Gaussian. There could be adversarial uh, components that, that affect our robotic system. Um, and may, uh, maybe most important, we have high dimensional data that requires efficient, efficient methods. And those of you who are familiar with control, probably more than me, know that uh, many of the Mathematical developments that allow for efficient optimization and control, efficient in parentheses, it's polynomial time, and they are based on complicated tools, such as semi-definite programming, sum of squares, and so on. And these are methods that are in theory efficient, but they do not scale to hundreds and thousands of uh, variables, such as that we would like to attack. Um, so I will talk about a few, uh, whatever I get through in the time that I have, and I'll start with non-stochastic control. Um, so uh, control with adversarial perturbations, and this is, in my opinion, uh, one of the most important aspects to, uh, that we should now develop, how to, to allow environments that are not stochastic and have adversarial components in them. So here is a, a definition of the problem, the non-stochastic control problem. Um, I'm limiting myself, the dynamics that I limit to is linear. So here, as opposed to a general arbitrary dynamics that I had in the original slide, um, the state evolves linearly according to some transformation matrix A, um, and the control also affects the next state linearly. Now, the world obviously is not uh, linear. So even the pendulum example is non-linear. Nevertheless, this is a very good approximation Real systems can be approximated linearly according to discrete time steps. It's very useful abstraction and used in all sorts of systems in the real world, mainly because that's kind of the only thing we know how to solve, uh, at least rigorously. So I'm assuming a linear system. Um, I have a, a cost function, uh, which I would like to minimize, and this is iterative cost function. And I have a noise term here, this W, and I'm not going, in classical control, this is assumed to be Gaussian, ID Gaussian noise. Here I do not want to assume this is ID Gaussian noise. Okay, I allow it to be arbitrary, arbitrary bounded noise. This is the main difference from classical control. So what has been done, as I said, control has been uh, around forever. Um, one of the most uh, important algorithms in control is called LQR, the Linear Quadratic Regulator. And what it does, it solves exactly the setting that I have shown, and even a more restricted version in which the cost function is quadratic. So the cost is some square function of the state and the control that I apply. 
Um, so in the case that the noise is Gaussian, it turns out that the whole formulation, the whole formulation I had before, minimizing the cost subject to this linear dynamics, can be solved exactly. Okay, there is an exact solution. Uh, this comes from the theory of differential equations, and you can prove that the best thing to do, the best control to choose, is to look at the state and apply some linear functional on top of it. Apply, take, you compute some fixed matrix K, you apply it to the state, that turns out to be the optimal thing to do. Wonderful theory, but again applies only to a Gaussian noise. Um, then people in control have also thought about what happens when we want a robust controller. So maybe robust versus adversarial perturbations. Um, and they invented this concept called age infinity control, um, which tries to compute the best controller subject to the worst possible noise that could ever happen. This is kind of the, uh, the general idea in age infinity control. And this is in general considered to be very pessimistic by control theorists and by, by everyone. Because if you plan for the worst case, it might happen that actually not the worst case happened. Could it be that the noise really is Gaussian or there was no noise at all? And then you were very pessimistic. Maybe you suffered much more than you could have had you done something better. Okay. Um, so what's missing from, from previous work? Well, I'd like, for example, to uh, all of these, both the LQR and the edge infinity control, apply only to quadratic noise. That's when we have efficient algorithms. If it's non-quadratic, like in machine learning, many times we have hinge loss, we have all sorts of loss functions, maybe Nati talked about, that are non-quadratic, right? So we, we love these uh, functions because they capture much more reality, and the theory does not apply there. Uh, we'd like computationally efficient for general functions, and we'd like an optimistic metric that allows us to capture worst case um, and yet not be that pessimistic. So if the worst case doesn't happen, then maybe we can still do something reasonable. Okay. So this is the first thing I want to describe. Um, and the setting that I choose, so I, uh, Gal said that I come from the online learning community, and this is very natural. Okay, it's a very natural thing to consider. So we consider a new model, which we call online control of linear dynamical systems. And this, this, the scenario, the setting is like this. Iteratively, think of an online, online sequence. So we have, we select some input, and then we observe the state, and then we see the loss. This appear, goes on online. Um, and so this is different from classical control where you kind of compute everything in hindsight. It's very natural again in machine learning, and I think it's very natural for the pendulum example, for, right? I mean, you do want, you see something happens, maybe you want to change things on the fly because wind is blowing from the left or whatever, whatever happens. Um, now, what is the goal? I said that we have worst case perturbations, we have worst case noise in the system and in the cost functions. And luckily, in um, online learning, we do have a metric that captures what, what to do there. This is called regret. Regret is defined like this. So we do not try to minimize the, the cost per se, because that could be um, completely arbitrarily bad. Right? By the way, if you don't follow the equations, that's fine. Just listen to what I'm saying, and I'll kind of give you the intuition or ask a question. So, if we have worst case inputs, there is nothing absolute that can be said about the performance that's very natural. All you can do is something relative. You can compete with some kind of comparator. Which comparator can you compete with? Well, maybe we want to compete with the best linear controller in hindsight that knows all the noises even before the sequence happens. If we, we could do it, that would be amazing. Um, now, there is a slight twist here. What we want to obtain is actually policy regret, not regret. So we want to compete with some controller that would have done something from the very beginning. Then the states that this controller would see would be different, not the same states that we are seeing. So that's what we want. It's a strong, very strong performance guarantee that we are shooting for. Um, and indeed, the main result is that we can do it. So we can, with absolute worst case perturbations, this that all I assume is that they are bounded, um, compete with the best controller in hindsight. And we can do it with an efficient algorithm. It's going to be a gradient-based algorithm. So very efficient, no sum of squares, no SDP, nothing of this, of this form. Okay. Um, 
I'm not going to go into proof or anything like that, but I do want to give you the, same, the main idea of how is this controller constructed. And the main idea is the following. If I look at the state or the control for a, for a certain linear policy, and I unfold the dynamics all the way back to the beginning of time, I get a very complicated expression. So all you need to understand about this expression is that it's complicated. It's complicated as a function of the K, of the linear controller that I want to, to use. Complicated, not convex, cannot be uh, computed efficiently. Right? So all of these are problematic. The main idea is to relax these matrices and forget about their structure. So instead of requiring that each matrix here is a power of the system and the, the controller, I'm gonna, gonna, just going to say this is some matrix that I'm going to, to discover online by gradient method. Um, so once we reformulate the problem in such a way, the problem becomes convex and solvable. Now there are still some problems. I need to ensure that, this, that whatever I could have done before, I can do now, that the number of parameters doesn't blow up. There is a way to do it, so we can prove that by this parameterization, if you add enough parameters, you still have the same representation power, you can control whatever the original Kalman, um, LQR or Kalman controller could do, we can still do. And further, more we can show there are not too many parameters, so it is learnable from a statistical perspective. Um, th there are some technical issues which I'm going to uh, slide over, but the overall algorithm will look like this. We parameterize a set of matrices, and we are going to use these matrices to create the control in the following way. The control is the linear functions of all the previous noises plus some, some, other, some linear term. So this is a very different control than used by LQR or used by edge infinity control. The control is based on the noises that, is, that the user has observed. And this is a new kind of parameterization. How do we know which matrices to use? We don't know, so we do what, uh, we, what we always do in learning, gradient descent. So we start with some kind of maybe zero matrices and keep on updating them according to the convex loss function that I have defined. Okay, so the idea is that we have a, a gradient-based controller, we call a gradient perturbation controller, that can update its parameters as it moves along and obtain some kind of non-trivial regret guarantee. Um, these are some experiments that we conducted. The first ones are with Gaussian perturbations. So we go to the setting in which the noises are IID Gaussian. Even though the controller was, not des it was designed for a much more general case, just to try it out as a sanity check. And indeed what we see is that the performance of this controller, the, the GPC, is slightly worse, but not by much. Okay, so it does recover the same performance as the LQR, which is the optimal solution the kind of absolute optimal solution. Um, we tried various other noise models. For example, we tried to look at uh, Gaussian random walk. Here the noise terms are correlated. Um, and now we can see that this LQR is no longer optimal. It's the blue line. Um, and our controller is now competing with the best con possible controller we can compute. In this case, this is a very special case that we can also compute the optimal controller. That's the black line and we kind of almost recover it. And finally, when we look at sinus sinusoidal perturbations, now we don't know anything about what the optimal controller looks like. It's impossible to, at least I don't know how to compute it. Um, and if you apply LQR, it, oops, if you apply LQR, it does terribly, uh, but the, this gradient-based controller manages to do significantly better. So this was encouraging. Um, then we thought to ourselves, OK, well, maybe we can, if we have a gradient-based algorithm, perhaps we can innovate even in the setting of Kalman. So even when, if the noise are IID Gaussian, perhaps we can say something stronger than what was known so far. Um, and this is called the tracking problem. This is a very classical problem used um, in the space industry to track celestial objects, like this cat here is trying to to track the, the laser pointer. Uh, mathematically speaking, we have some kind of, again, linear dynamical system, and the costs are how far we are from the object. 
So X star T, that's the position of the laser pointer, we're trying to track it. Now why would we expect to be able to do anything better here than classical methods? And the reason comes from optimization. So we are now using a gradient-based method. And it is known that for gradient-based methods, if we have these kind of two functions, one of them looks like this, piecewise linear, and the other looks smooth and curved like this. It is known that this function is much better, much better behaved. Uh, the reason is that you can apply some kind of Taylor approximation around every point, right? So the second derivative here is meaningful. It is not a meaningless, here there is no second derivative, it's zero. And here we can have a second derivative and it tells us where the optimum lies and we can attain a faster rate. And indeed for the tracking problem, the loss functions are, the classical loss functions are mean square error, how far we are from the optimum. Um, and this allows us to get hopefully to get a better rate, um, and indeed we can, we can get some rate which is uh, the regret behaves logarithmic with time as opposed to square root, number of iterations, this is tight, uh, and this improves Kalman's original result. So this, uh, I like it, um, and the, the, the challenge is this is not immediate from what I showed you because these cost functions, remember I'm not using the state and the and the control in an immediate way. That's why, by the way, the Kalman filter doesn't get this kind of result immediately. There is a reparameterization. We use a filter based on the perturbations, and this presents more variables into the system, and it's not immediately clear that the function remains strongly convex, but that's what we prove. Um, then you can ask, well, what happens if we don't know the system? So, I, so far I assumed that I apply a filter based upon knowledge of the perturbations, knowledge of the noise, and I need to know the system for that in order to compute it. Um, so it is possible to recover the system and then apply what I said even in the case of adversarial noise. Um, and I'm going to skip it in favor of time to move on to the next topic. Um, so all of these ideas apply to linear dynamical systems. Uh, but I w I s in reality, another thing that has changed that's also on our agenda is what will do we do with deep neural networks, right? So today these are, anyone who ignores them is missing something very important about machine learning. They work the best for supervised learning. For some um, um, recurrent neural networks are state of the art in, in time series prediction. We do not want to ignore them and we want to use them uh, for control. So how can we build some kind of theory for that? Um, and that's the next topic. So we're going to apply boosting to control. And those of you who are not, I'm, I'm kind of assuming many or most of you maybe heard about boosting in the classical statistical learning scenario. Um, what is boosting? Boosting means you take some kind of simple method, rule of thumb, and are able to enhance it by composition to create something much more powerful. For example, if you want to classify emails, it is very easy to generate a rule of thumb. For example, if you see the word uh, drugs in the email, spam. So this is not a, a co accurate predictor, but it has some correlation to the actual, right? It is better than random. And you can t aggregate. The theory of boosting says how do you aggregate many, many, many such rules of thumb into a very, very accurate predictor overall. Uh, and all of this theory was built into um, supervised learning theory. Uh, that's not what we're going to do in control. In control, we have a dynamical system. So I'm going back to the first slide I had. In a dynamical system, we have a state that evolves non-linearly according to some dynamics and some noise, and we want to minimize costs. Very, very different situation, right? The main issue is that we have a state. We can't just combine things in an arbitrary way. And another main, main difference is that we are online. We don't have all the data a priori that we can check and see which one is better. Um, our goal is again to minimize policy regret. Here we want to, com to compete, we, to want to minimize cost, compete with a certain class of controllers or predictors um, and do well even if we um, had used this predictor from the beginning of time. So the states could be different than the states that we actually observe. Now, 
The main challenge for, for boosting online control, we might have a set of weak learners. So maybe algorithm one creates control one, algorithm two creates control two, and so on. And it is tempting to kind of combine them all into a single control and use that. But the issue is that we have, we have state, right? So algorithm one has a state xt1, and algorithm two has a different state. And if I'm going to use this kind of combination, the system has a completely different state that is different from what each algorithm by itself thinks the state is. Um, so the question is, can we combine all of these into a, into a single predictor that can overcome this difficulty? Um, and that is the, the result. We can indeed do it. Um, the way to do it goes by several steps. One of them is removing the effect uh, of a state by something called stability. If you have a stable system, what it means is that when you, the system changes so slowly that uh, if you take some, some kind of history, it has finite memory. If you take this memory of time and consider loss functions that depend only on this memory, it does not depend on anything you did much before. So we can think of predictors that predict over this entire chunk of memory and move on to the next chunk of memory. And that will kind of alleviate the issue of state. Um, the other issue comes from the fact that you're doing online learning. You're not combining everything in a statistical way. And the way to get around it is by assuming some kind of algorithm that has a regret bound in the online sense. Which algorithm is that? So assume your favorite LSTM, RNN, whatever it is, has some kind of guarantee compared to a certain class of predictors. Maybe you can do as well as a class of predictors. That is an assumption now. The only way to prove something rigorous about, learning, about uh, deep neural nets, at least the one that I know, it's very hard to prove rigorous things about them, is that to make an assumption. So I'm assuming this deep, deep neural net works well in some sense. And assuming that we can combine many different nets to attain a stronger guarantee. We can combine them in such a way that we can now compete not with the original set of F that I called it, the set of all neural nets of a certain depth, but with the convex hull of them, which could be strictly larger in the case of nonlinear predictors. So this is the kind of guarantee we get. Just to tell you a word about the main idea, the main idea is to apply the learners not to the loss directly, but to the residual loss of the previous learner. Okay, so I create, you can think of time moving on the horizontal uh, line and the, the, the learner on the vertical line. What we're going to do is each learner is going to create a learning problem to the next one, which is the residual loss that is left after this, per, this uh, controller made its prediction. So we take the gradient of the loss function for that person and move it to the next learner and so on. So this way, every iteration we apply the control of the first algorithm, second algorithm, and so on. And this way, we combine all of these and move on to the next iteration by looking at the residual loss. So this, this kind of alleviates the state, because every controller has a different state, and that's perfectly fine. All it cares about is the state of its own residual loss compared to the learners before it. <coughs> OK, so let me show you some experiments now it combines both of the previous um, ideas that I mentioned. So this is again uh, the setting of linear control with Gaussian noise. Oops. So this is the weak learner Gaussian noise. This purple line is the optimal thing to do. It's the LQR. There is nothing that can do better than it. And this is provable, and indeed it is the best. This red line is the controller that I described before, the gradient-based controller. And the blue line is what happens when you boost it. And the results are consistent across even 100 dimensions, that we get some kind of improvement. The improvement but doesn't improve upon state of the art. But if you move on to more structured noise, then already we can see uh, that, so, this, so the purple line, for example, here is sinusoidal noise, is the LQR, the, the best linear controller. It does the worst. Uh, this red line here is the, um, uh, the gradient perturbation controller, and this uh, orange one is the um, recurrent neural net, which does better than the gradient-based, and both of them can be boosted to improve their 
performance, so this methodology applies even to non-provable kind of machines that, such as deep neural nets. Um, I'm now going back to the first example I started off with of the inverted pendulum. So suppose we want to control, I wonder if it will work if I press here. No. Okay, so I have a nice video, but unfortunately it doesn't work. So, um, so this, is, this is the initial pendulum by moving the, the cart or moving the base, applying force to the base of the pendulum, I can control its top. And what you would see here is that uh, this, the loss of the LQR controller, classical controller, explodes. This is reasonable because it's a nonlinear system. The red line here is the weak learner that I've described, gradient-based controller, and we can apply boosting to further get the blue loss. And if I were to show the video, you would see that this is, this is very, very stable. So this really does manage to control the pendulum, and hopefully this can be used not only for pendulums, but things that are more important, like robotics. So um, I talked about robust control and argued that to, to really get robust controllers, we have to move to the non-stochastic world and allow for adversarial perturbations rather than IID Gaussian noise. And I talked about the metric of regret, why it makes sense in this setting, and why it is reasonable, and how it gives rise to gradient-based algorithms. Um, for deep nets, situation is that we don't have very good analysis even for supervised learning. So I talked about how to combine very deep controllers to, to improve the control. Um, I have more, we have, a, our group has more work on control, which I don't have time to describe, but you're welcome to check out this website that has uh, detailed explanations of what I discussed, as well as more methods. And I will conclude here. Thank you. have time for questions. Yes. Does your, does your system uh, work also for a human uh, example? Let's say that one is controlling a drone. Yeah. And uh, can you take it as an input and learn? Um, if I understand your question correctly, there are two types of questions you can ask. One of them is, is the perturbation cr created by the human? Uh, the answer is, is, is definitely yes. I mean, I think that's the only way to kind of model a human uh, perturbation is not something that's Gaussian, for sure, right? We have some, some adversary trying to, or maybe a human walking in front of the drone and trying to wave its hands or whatever. So that is one way to model adversarial perturbations. You could do it with edge infinity control, but I believe our method is more robust. It's a little bit, I think, more complicated. Uh, let's say that a human is an experienced person mm -hmm. who is 20 years controlling drones. And I would like to take his knowledge mm -hmm. into yeah. the controller. Yeah, so what you're describing uh, is imitation learning, how to learn from, expert, from a human expert. This is not related to what I talked about, but it, there is a rigorous way of, of doing it in reinforcement learning, which is a more general subject than control, and that is how to take expert advice and learn from it. Off policy or imitation learning, this is called. There is such a field, very well developed and very successful. Yeah. yeah. Let, let me get you the microphone so that people okay. in the back can hear you. So I wanted to, to see if I understood correctly. In, in your problems, the, the only uh, unexpected thing, stochastics or however you want to model it, was the, the dynamics of the system. The observations were, uh, were completely accurate. Is that correct? Uh, the obver observations are completely accurate, but the, the adversarial part is the perturbation. So I forget which slide I had, oh, never mind. So we had the, uh, the dynamics evolves. The state I can observe perfectly, the control I can also observe perfectly because I created it. The system, the matrices A and B are assumed to be known. And the noise is the additional term that some adversary adds to the system. So in the, in the example of a, a pendulum, the 
the way the physics determines the matrix A, how the system evolves. The state X is the location of the pendulum, the ball, where, the angle, and so on. And the control is how much force I apply. All of these things are known. What is unknown is, for example, if a wind blows on the pendulum, someone hits it, so that is captured by the additional letter W that I had there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, the Kalman filter is more applied to cases also when the, you have noise in the observation itself, and then uh, assuming that noise is yes. uh, Gaussian, and uh, so you didn't yes. uh, take upon the There is a huge literature. Control is a very deep and uh, mathematically deep and uh, well-studied topic. Um, as I said, but I didn't dive into details at all, we can extend this uh, regret approach even to partially or partial observations. This means that you do not observe the XT, but you observe some projection of it according to a linear matrix. This is the partial observation model, and we can do even things in this model. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions? Let's thank Elad again. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, what we have left is just the uh, awards and symposium closing. Uh, so uh, let me take the opportunity to thank you for staying that late and to thank my colleagues in the research program committee, Professor Galchechik, Professor Shai Sharif Schwartz, Professor Amir Globazon, and Professor Shai Mano, who helped in considering the submissions and uh, advised regarding this event. Let's give them a round of applause. And uh, some of you might be a little tensed regarding the Best Poster Award, so uh, I'm going to disappoint you a little. Uh, the committee members found it very difficult to choose just one uh, award out of all the great posters that were presented here today, even to select just one each. And therefore, uh, we decided that you may all consider yourselves as winners. So, thank you all. Thank you for staying. Thank you for presenting. And see you next year. Thank you. Bye-bye.